Well, now that we've had a little rest, I know we're all ready to sing, right? All righty. I'm not sure if we're going to have words or not, but let's stand and sing, and whatever comes out, praise the Lord. Good morning, everyone. Good to see all of you. We're having some uh, technical difficulties, so we're not able to live stream today, which is disappointing. But uh, we'll get, we're still going to record the service, and, and we'll get it posted up on Facebook and on the, on the YouTube. That way folks will be able to see it uh, later on this afternoon, but they won't be able to watch live with us this morning. But we'll, we'll get all that worked out and find out what's going on. So that's why we started a little bit late this morning, but that's okay. We're still going to have a good time in the house of the Lord today, aren't we? We're still going to worship together. We're going to study His Word together. We're going to fellowship together. And it's going to be a good day. If you're visiting with us today, we want to welcome you here to Blackwater Park Baptist Church. We are so glad that you are here with us. And we hope that as you're here today that you feel welcomed and, and the Lord speaks to your heart and, and does something in your life as we worship Him together. All right. Well, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. And then we'll continue on with our service. So let's bow together for prayer this morning. Our dear Heavenly Father, once again, we come before you thanking you for all that you've done for us. Father, we thank you for, Lord, your, prep, your, uh, your care for us, Lord, your provision for us, the, Lord, the protection that you, that you give us every day. Father, Lord, we thank you for things that, that we don't even know about that you do. Father, I'm convinced that when we get to heaven, Lord, we're going to find out that you did some awesome things for us that we had no clue about while we were here. And so, Father, we do thank you for all those things. Father, I thank you for the privilege of being able to meet together today and worship in your house. And, and Father, I ask that, Lord, as we worship today, Lord, that Lord, our hearts will be in tune with what you want. Lord, Lord, this service is not about us. Lord, it's about you. This is your house, Lord. This is your service. And Father, we submit ourselves to you this morning. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. All right, thank you. you may be seated. This morning we want to do something a little bit special before we, before we sing some more. Today is our graduate recognition. So I'm going to ask Nathaniel if he would come forward. Nathaniel is our, is our graduate this year. Nathaniel's graduating from uh, Carson High School. And I know this year is a little bit different. No, normally there would have been a graduation ceremony and, and getting to walk across the stage and all that kind of, thing, all that kind of stuff. But with all that's going on in our nation and, and our, in our world and things that are happening, uh, that's not quite possible right now. I know the, I know the, the, the seniors graduating this year are, are disappointed about that, and, and I hate that for them. But we still want to make sure that we recognize our graduates, amen, because they put in a lot of hard work a lot of time, a lot of effort. To, to, to reach the point that you graduate high school takes a lot of dedication. 
It takes, it takes a lot of hard work. And, and so when you reach this point, you deserve to be honored. You deserve to be recognized for your achievement. And so, Nathaniel, today we, we uh, recognize you for your high school graduation. And we're, we're proud of you. And we know that God's going to do great things with you as you go on. I, I believe you're heading to, to UNC in the fall, aren't you? Going to go over there and, and uh, go, go to college there. And, and uh, so we, we just thank the Lord for him. Thank the Lord for, for how he's working in his life and, and getting, into, getting, getting him to this point. And I know it's taken a lot of prayers on, on behalf of his parents. And you know, they, they've, they prayed for him and helped him and, and encouraged him as he's gone through high school. And, and so we, we thank the Lord for all that. Amen. Nathaniel, if you come up here for me. I asked Nathaniel earlier what all those cords mean around his neck. And uh, he started naming off some stuff. But just suffice to say, it's a bunch of honors, all right? <laughs> and so, so we know Nathaniel's done a great job in high school. I know John and Susan and his family are very proud of him. And we as a church family are proud of him as well. So first of all, Nathaniel, I'd like to give you this certificate of recognition. It says to Nathaniel Kimball, awarded this certificate in recognition of your high school graduation, 7th day of June, year 2020. And I had the privilege of signing it, Pastor Chad Hayes. So we'll give that to you. And also we have a gift for you from the church. God's Promises for Graduates, Class of 2020. And it's even in silver camouflage. Amen. All right. So we'll give that for you. You can take that to college with you and, and read it. And hope that brings you some encouragement. All right. Appreciate you. Love you, bud. All right. <clears throat> Well, now let's uh, join the praise team once again, and we'll sing a couple more songs before we, before we come to the Lord and, and give our offering together. All right? So let's sing together. Again, worship is participatory, so you stand, you sing with us, and join us. All right? This next song might be a new one for some of you, but it's a beautiful song. It's called, Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me. Glory. 
Still my lips shall repeat.
Thank you, praise team. Appreciate that. Ushers, if you'll go ahead and come forward, please. And as our ushers come, I'll remind you, like we did last week, our ushers will come around. They will bring the plate to you. You don't have to grab the plate or anything like that. Just place your offering in the plate, if you would, please. All right? And that, that way, uh, we, won't, we, we, we uh, won't have to have a lot of hands touching the plates or anything like that. So, Brother Neil, if you would, lead us in prayer, please. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for today, and thank you for this opportunity to gather in your house again today, Lord. Please bless this offering and use it for your goodness, Lord. All this we ask in your name. Amen. Take your Bibles this morning, please, and turn, if you would, to John chapter 15. In John chapter 15, this morning, we're going to finish up the series that we've been working on through the seven I Am statements in the book of John, a series that I've entitled, Who is Jesus? And so far, we've looked at, I am the bread of life, the light of the world the door, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life. Last week we looked at the way, the truth, and the life. And if you think back over all those messages, we, we've seen Jesus as a lot of things, haven't we? We've seen Jesus as our protector, our provider, our comforter, our guide, our, our sustainer, our hope. The list goes on and on and on. But if you wanted to sum it up all in one nutshell, we have seen Jesus as God. We have seen Jesus as the promised Messiah, as the Savior come to, to purchase the redemption of mankind. That's what John's Gospel is all about. The theme of John's Gospel, as I've told you the last couple of weeks, was the deity of Christ, the fact that Jesus was God. And nothing I, that, that I can think of, nothing that, that, that comes to my mind could bring us greater comfort than to know that Jesus Christ was who he said he was. Amen? The fact that he was God. The fact that he was Savior. And maybe I shouldn't use the word was. He is God. Amen? He is Savior. And this morning we're going to look at the last I am statement of, 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 of Jesus here in this book. Number seven. I'm kind of sad to come to the end of this series. I've enjoyed preaching it. But this statement is I am the true vine. Now like the one last week, this was spoken the night of the Last Supper, the, the, the night that he shared that last Passover with his disciples. And later on that evening, he would be arrested and hauled off and tried and, and eventually crucified. But here we find them having just observed that Passover meal and, and 
Now, if, if I read correctly and, and, and study correctly, they, they're on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane where, where Jesus was going to spend some time praying. And, and maybe having just observed the Lord's Supper and, and, and the Passover and, and having drunk of that cup together, maybe, maybe that was the imagery that was in his mind when he said, I am the true vine. Or maybe it was that he, as they were walking toward the Garden of Gethsemane, maybe they passed a vineyard. Maybe they passed a place where, where there were vines growing. Great vines grew very plentiful all over the country back then. It was a very common sight. Many people you know, worked in vineyards back then. But whatever it was that, that brought this image to Jesus' mind and caused him to use this imagery to explain these things to his disciples. He knew that it would be something they'd recognize. He knew that it would be something they'd be familiar with. And it was something they'd be able to relate to very easily. And just like last week's statement, when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he was giving them words of comfort that he knew they would need. See, he knew that, that even though he wouldn't be there physically with them much longer, and he wouldn't... <clears throat> He wouldn't be there to help them. He wouldn't be their safety net, so to speak, that they, that they depended on. And he knew that, that they were going to have to go on and continue ministering without his physical presence there. But he wanted them to understand something. It wasn't his physical presence there that made the difference. The spiritual power that they needed did not come from the fact that he was there with them in flesh and blood. It came from somewhere much deeper. It came from something much deeper than that. And he wanted them to understand that. He wanted them to know that before he went away. So that they wouldn't be discouraged. They wouldn't just give up and quit. This particular statement, I am the true vine, gives us a look at Jesus from a perspective that we haven't yet looked at in this series. I, I mentioned we've seen him as our protector and provider and, and shepherd and, and sustainer and all these other things. But this morning we're going to look at him from a, from a far different perspective than any of those. It's a perspective from which we cannot neglect to view him. We have to view him like this. You say, preacher, what is that perspective? That perspective is him as our sovereign. The word sovereign means master. It means ruler. It means the one who has authority. And when he said, I am the true vine, it was a picture of his sovereignty, a picture of him, him as the master, the one who is in control of it all. So this morning, let's bow for a word of prayer and then dive into these verses in John chapter 15. And we're going to take a look at him as our sovereign. Let's pray together. Our dear Heavenly Father, once again, we come before you thanking you, Lord, for just all your goodness to us. Father, we thank you, Lord, most of all for Jesus. We thank you for sending him to die on the cross for us, to, to pay the cost of our redemption. Father, we thank you that Lord, that you are sovereign this morning. Lord, you are in control. Lord, there is nothing that takes you by surprise. There is nothing that, that you are not in control of or that you cannot handle. Lord, we live in a world today where it seems like a lot of things are out of control. They're spinning this way and that, and, and all kinds of things are happening. But Father, Lord, we know it's all in your hand. Father, thank you this morning for your sovereignty. Father, we ask that you'd speak to us through your word. Lord, as we come to this time this morning, may our hearts be open. And Lord, may you show us those things that we need to see. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. First of all, this morning, I want to look at the recognition of his sovereignty. The recognition of his sovereignty. And as we begin looking at this, first of all, we see his identity. His identity. Look, if you would, at verse 1. John chapter 15, verse 1. Jesus speaks these words. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. I am the true vine. The very statement that we're focusing on tonight. The vine had become a symbol of Israel. A symbol of, of God's covenant people. And the Jews were proud of that. They, they were proud of the fact that they were considered God's chosen people. They were proud of that covenant that God had made with them way back in the Old Testament. But we also know that throughout history, from the time God made that covenant with them, we know that Israel strayed away from God, didn't they? 
they deviated from the path that God had for them. They went off after idols and, and other things and, and, they, and they got off track. They, they strayed away from God. Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 21 says, Yet I have planted thee a noble vine, holy a right seed. How then art thou turned into the degenerate plant of a strange vine unto me? That's some strong words, isn't it? And so he says, I am the true vine. I am the real thing. I'm not a mere representation of anything. I'm not the wrong one. I am the true, right, real vine. Anybody that puts their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and I mean Jew, Gentile, you name it. Anybody who puts their faith and trust in him for salvation, they are grafted into him as the vine. And they become part of his family. They become part of his body. He says, I am the true vine. And he says, my father is the husbandman. A husbandman was another term for, for, for a gardener, a, a vine dresser, so to speak. Someone who, who took care of, of the vineyard. Someone who worked and, and diligently took care of, of the vines in that vineyard. And when he says, my father's the husband, husbandman, what he's saying is, hey, I'm the vine. He said, he said, my father takes great pride. He takes great care. Great interest when it comes to the spiritual welfare of those who are part of the vine. Just like that gardener, that vine dresser took great care in the welfare of, of those vines and, and, and the branches that bore the fruit. The Father takes great care in us as believers. Why? Because we are part of the vine. God has great interest in us and, and great love for us and great care for us. Now go down, go down if you would to verse 5. The first part of verse 5. Jesus repeats the, the, himself somewhat. He says, I am the vine. He's referring back to what he said in verse 1. But he goes a little bit farther. He says, I am the vine, but ye are the branches. He says, I'm the vine, guys. He says, but you're the branches. You are the extensions of the vine. We as believers, we are those branches, just like the disciples were that he was addressing here. We are the, the, the branches, the, the extension of that vine. We are grafted into him. That's his identity. He is the vine. We're the branches as believers that are, that are grafted into him. Not only do we see his identity this morning, but number two, we see his intent. We see his intent. We see what he wanted to do, what his plan was. Look, if you would, at verse 2. He says, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So first of all, as we look at that verse, we see what God's intent for us is as believers, as branches. He intends for us to bear fruit. He wants us to be fruitful. In John chapter 15, down in verse 16, just a, just a little while after he spoke these words, he would say this, he said, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that you should go and bring forth what? Fruit. And that your fruit should remain. It is God's plan for us that we as believers, that we as branches grafted into him as the vine, that we bear fruit. I believe he talks about inner fruit first of all. The, the, the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. The love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Those are all qualities. Those are all characteristics that, that we as believers are to allow the Holy Spirit to work in us and, and, and to develop in us and, and, and manifest through us. And then that inner fruit begins to show up as outer fruit. The good works and the attitudes that honor God, that further the church, that further the cause of the gospel. That comes from the Holy Spirit working inside of us. This fruit is not fruit that we just you know, develop ourselves and, 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 and work up ourselves. That's not how this thing works. 
We as believers were called to bear fruit. Why? Because the Holy Spirit indwelling us, living within us, works through us and develops that fruit and then manifests it through us. It's all about Him. Think about the reason vines and trees bear fruit. What's found in fruit? Seeds. What do you need seeds for? Reproduction, right? We are called to bear fruit. Why? So that we can share the gospel and see others come to know Jesus Christ as our Savior. That's why we're called to bear fruit. It's all about reaching the world with the gospel. It's all about being witnesses for Him. And the only way to bear fruit is through Him, through the indwelling Holy Spirit that works in us. And so he says, that's my intent for you. I want you to bear fruit. And so the Father works to help the branches bear fruit. He says here, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. That phrase, taketh away, is interesting. It actually has a twofold meaning. I was studying this and, and, and found this out. And, and it's, it's kind of cool the way this works out. Because first of all, that phrase, taketh away, can mean to lift up. Okay? It means to, to lift it up. Sometimes a, a gardener or, or, a, or a vine dresser, as he's working with the vines, sometimes he'd take a branch maybe that's, that's dragging on the ground, and what he would do is he would kind of lift it up and tie it to the trellis. And he would do that so that it would have opportunity to get sunlight, to get nourishment that it needed in order to grow and, and to bear fruit. And, and I began to think about that, and, and, and to me, that, that, that became a picture of how God deals with believers maybe who, 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 are, who are heading off on the wrong track. Wayward believers, he, he lifts them up and, and, and he begins to correct them and begins to try to help them and, and, and begins to try to draw them, them back to, 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 to where they ought to be. To bring them back into a fruitful relationship with him. But that word taketh away also has another meaning. And it's the one that you're probably thinking of. Taketh away also can mean remove. See, if a gardener came through and is working and checking on the vines and, and taking care of the, of the garden and, and, and he comes across you know, a dead branch, the gardener would remove it. I believe that here is a, is a reference to those who aren't saved, those who, who, who maybe profess Christ, but they're not truly born again. I think of Judas Iscariot. Had he not at the Last Supper, just, just a little while before, spoken words about being betrayed and then dipped the sop and, and told Judas, he said, what, whatever thou doest, do quickly. He'd already told the disciples that one of them was going to betray him, and now Judas has been removed because he's going off to betray Jesus. So he, sometimes he, he calls away those dead branches. He, he removes those things. Now, don't get me wrong. That's not a reference to losing your salvation. Scripture teaches that that is not the case. We can't lose our salvation. But what this is teaching is that sometimes God removes hindrances from, from the vine. Sometimes God removes hindrances from the body so that the church can grow spiritually. Again, the Father has great care, great, great interest in the vine, and, and He does what's best. He wants to help us to grow spiritually. But we go on, and, and, and he says, every branch that beareth fruit, notice what he does. It says, he purgeth it. The fruitful branches, the ones that are bearing fruit, you'd think he'd leave them alone, right? You'd think he'd look at them and say, well, they're, they're, they're bearing fruit. They're okay. But no, sometimes he goes through and prunes even some good ones, doesn't he? Why does he do that? Because God is more interested in best than he is just good. Okay? I want you to get that. You see, sometimes God has to remove things from our lives that maybe in and of themselves aren't bad, so to speak. But he knows that they're holding us back from our full potential as believers. He wants us to reach our fullest potential 
for him. And so sometimes he has to call away even that which may not be bad in and of itself, but he knows it's going to hold us back from our fullest potential. You say, preacher, what is that? It's called sanctification. We've talked about that. It's the continual process by which God works in our lives to grow us and mature us as believers. That's what's being pictured here. Is the sanctification of the believer. The gardener, the husbandman, the father is working to help us as the branches who are grafted into the vine achieve our fullest potential and bear the best fruit for his honor and for his glory. Is that not a beautiful picture, folks? I know the pruning process is often painful. I know it's not fun sometimes. But folks, trust the one doing the pruning. Amen? He knows what's best. He knows what he's doing. He prunes with a purpose. And that purpose is our best. That purpose is his honor, his glory. And they go on to verse 3. Notice what he says in verse 3. He says, Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. He's already shared his intent with them. He's shared the fact that he wants them to be fruitful. He's shared the fact that the Father works in our lives to help make us fruitful to our fullest potential. And then he tells them in verse 3, he says, This is what I've been doing with you all this time. He said, this is what's been happening all this time. As you spent time with me and as I've taught you and as we've ministered together. He said, I've been pruning. I've been preparing you. I've been getting you ready to be fruitful after I'm gone. I told you, the, the spiritual power that they needed did not come from his physical presence with them. The spiritual power they needed came from a deeper place. It came from the Holy Spirit working in them. It came from that pruning. It came from the care of the Father. And he wanted them to know, hey, I may not physically be here with you anymore much longer. He said, but that doesn't mean the Father doesn't care about you. You're still going to have what you need. He's still going to work in your life. He's still going to prune. He's still going to help you to achieve your fullest potential for his honor and for his glory. You don't have to worry about that. Two chapters later in John chapter 17, as Jesus was in the garden and he was praying, he was praying for his disciples. And notice what he says, John chapter 17, verse 17. He says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. He's praying, Father, keep working on them. Father, keep sanctifying them. Keep, keep working in them. Keep helping them. Keep, keep doing whatever it needs to be done to make them fruitful for you. His intent is that we be fruitful. The recognition of his sovereignty. The recognition of the fact that he is in control and that he has a plan and that he has a purpose. But then number two, we see the requirement of his sovereignty. The requirement of his sovereignty. See, there's, there's something that he requires of us as, as, as our master, as our Lord. First of all, we see the necessity of abiding. Abiding is a key word in these next few verses. The necessity of abiding. Look at verse 4. He says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for, and this is key, look at this last phrase, for without me, you can do nothing. I went on into verse 5 and, and hit the last half of it. We looked at the first half just a moment ago. But he says, abide in me, without me, you can do nothing. That word abide, it means to dwell, it means to continue, it means to, to remain. You see, the reason it was so important that the, that the branches be grafted into the vine is because the branches in and of themselves could not bear fruit. They had to have the sap flowing through the vine and into the branches. The nourishment that provided what the branches needed to bear fruit didn't come from the branch itself. It came from the vine. And so he says, abide in me. A branch that's disconnected from the vine, guess what? It cannot produce fruit. It's just a branch. 
So he says, dwell in me, abide in me, continue in me. Why? Because I am the source of the power that you need. It's the only way to be spiritually fruitful. Folks, we can do good works all we want to, but if we're doing them in our own power, guess what? It's like a sound of, 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 of tinkling cymbal and sounding brass. It's nothing. It's, it, it, it's worthless. There is nothing good that we can do apart from the Holy Spirit's power working within us. Anything done in our own power, guess what? It's not good. The Bible says our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, aren't they? It has to be Him working through us. And if we're not abiding in Him, if we're not continuing in Him and, and, and dwelling in Him and allowing His power to flow through us and, and be manifested through us, then we're not fruitful. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5, Paul tells the Corinthian church, he says, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. It's got to be Him, folks. It's got to be Him. How do we abide in Him? We, we abide in Him through faith. Faith in Him. We, we, we abide in Him through, through love for Him. We abide in Him through obedience to Him. But we let Him work through us. It's done in His power for His honor and for His glory. The necessity of abiding. If we don't abide in Him, guess what? We cannot be fruitful. Remember our theme for this year? Let whose glory fill this place? His. If it's all about our glory, guess what? We're going to bear no fruit. But the more His glory fills this place, the more His Spirit works in us and through us as believers and as a body and as a church family, the more fruit that we are going to bear, the more fruitful that we are going to be, and the more glorifying and honoring to Him we're going to be. And that's what I want. And I hope that's what you want too. Amen. The necessity of abiding. But then we also see the neglect of abiding. The neglect of abiding. Verse 6, if a man abide not in me, it says he's cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. Again, a reference to those who are not genuinely, biblically, truly saved. Again, if you're saved, you're grafted into the vine. You're, a, you're, you're, you're a part of that vine and, and that Holy Spirit indwells you and, 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 and that power flows through you. But those who don't abide in Him, they're like branches disconnected from the vine. What happens to a branch that's disconnected from the vine? It's dead, first of all, isn't it? And then it dries up, doesn't it? And down south, we have a word for dead, dry branches. We call it kindling. It's what you use to make fire, isn't it? Because it lights up pretty quick, amen? Amen. And here's what it says. He says, men gather them, cast them into the fire, and they're burned. We must abide in Him. It's got to be Him. It's got to be the Holy Spirit working through us if we're going to be fruitful. The requirement of His sovereignty is that we abide in Him. Finally, number three. As we close this morning, we see the result of His sovereignty. The result of his sovereignty. And we see three things here. First of all, in verse 7, we see the answer. The answer. You see, verse 7 says, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you. So, so we know this is a, a two-way street. We abide in him. And then he abides in us through, through the indwelling Holy Spirit. And his power work is through us. If, it, he says, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you. Notice what it says. You shall ask what you will. And it shall be done unto you. I said, preacher, that makes God out to be, you know, it sounds like it makes him out to be kind of like a genie. You'll have whatever you want. That's, that's not what this is saying. See, the key phrase in this verse is that first one. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you. Because let me tell you what happens the more you abide in him and the more that he abides in you and the more the, that he begins to work in you and through you. 
You become more and more spiritually mature. You grow closer to Him. You grow as a believer. And as you do that, your desires begin to change. And your desires begin to match His, don't they? So you, be, you, you begin to come more like Him and, you, and your desires and your wants begin to change and you begin to want what He wants. You begin to, to desire what He desires. You begin to love what He loves. And when that happens, that affects how you pray. Because the more He abides in you and you abide in Him, the more the Holy Spirit begins to prompt your heart as to how to pray. And the Holy Spirit begins to show you how you ought to pray. And then the, the closer you get to Him, the more you pray according to His prompting. And the more you pray according to His prompting, guess what? God grants those things, doesn't He? It's not talking about God as a genie. It's talking about us growing in Him and becoming more like Him and praying more according to His will and, and according as to His Spirit leads us. And when we pray according to the mind of God... God does it, doesn't he? That's what that's saying. The more we recognize him as sovereign, the more we submit to him as sovereign, and, and the more we let our sovereign work and do in us as he sees fit, the more in line with his desires and his wants and his ideas and his opinions and his knowledge that we come. And the more we come in line with those things, the more we pray according to those things, according to his will. You see, sanctification is all about God bringing us more and more in line with Him. And so we see the answer. In 1 John chapter 5, we'll get to this passage probably in a couple weeks on Sunday nights. But in verses 14 and 15, John, the same one who wrote this gospel, wrote these words. He said, And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything, what does it say? According to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions we desired of him. Lines up with what he said in his gospel, doesn't it? Now we also know the flip side of that's true. Selfish prayers have no guarantee of, of being granted by God. In fact, God says in, in, in Scripture, in other places, He, he says you, you ask and you receive not. Why? Because you ask amiss. You ask selfishly. But one of the results of His sovereignty working in our lives is that we come more into line with Him and, and His principles and, and His leading. And then as we pray according to His leading, He, he, he answers, He grants. Then as we go on to verse 8, first part of verse 8, we see number 2, the acclaim. Something else happens when, when the sovereignty of God begins to work in our life and become evident. Look at verse 8, he says, Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. You see, if we truly abide in Him as we ought to, and His Holy Spirit works through us, and we begin to bear the fruit that is the result of His Holy Spirit power, guess what? It doesn't point to us. It gives glory to Him, doesn't it? He's the one who gets the acclaim. He's the one who gets the honor. He's the one who gets the glory. When we bear fruit that is the result of Holy Spirit power, He's honored and glorified, and He's the only one worthy of it, isn't He? If what you call good works brings glory and honor and recognition to yourself, I'd check up on the good works, amen? Because it's not meant to bring glory to us. It's meant to bring glory to Him. Paul wrote to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. He said, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to who? The glory of God. Do all to the glory of God. The answer, the acclaim, and then finally we see the affirmation. The last part of verse 8. So shall ye be my disciples. If we truly abide in Him as we ought, and He abides in us, and that power flows through us and, and, and works in us and manifests itself through us in the form of fruit. 
then that fruitfulness will serve, number one, as evidence of our salvation, evidence of our discipleship to a lost and dying world. Scripture does say that we'll be known by our fruits, doesn't it? But you know what? It'll also be evidence and assurance to our own hearts that we are truly saved. It affirms it to others. It affirms it to our own hearts. Because what we see in our lives, what they see in our lives, matches up with what God says they ought to see. It matches up with His Word. And it's affirmation. Folks, if we're in the family, there ought to be a family resemblance. Amen? When Jesus expounded upon this statement, I am the true vine, he was, he was emphasizing the importance of spiritually being one with him. Again, being brought into line with, with him as the vine. It's that union between us and him that results in communion between him and us. But folks, the only way to have that is to truly abide in him. To continue, to remain, to dwell, so that, so that you're part of that vine and, and, and it's His power flowing through you and nothing else. Folks, He truly is our, our sovereign. He's our master. We have, we, we have to submit to Him and, and trust Him. Again, that's, what, that's why salvation is more than just a prayer, folks. Salvation is, is submitting ourselves to Him as Lord and Savior. Because he is sovereign. He is the master. He is the one who has all authority. One day the book of Revelation tells us that everybody in the world is going to recognize that, aren't they? One day the Bible says that every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So in, in light of this statement, folks, I invite you to examine yourself this morning. I invite you to take a look at your heart. And we need to ask ourselves this question. Are we abiding in Him as we ought to? So that we can be spiritually fruitful as we've been called to be. Heads bowed, eyes closed if you would please. Maybe you're here this morning and as the word has been preached, God has been speaking to your heart and God has showed you that this whole thing about being grafted into the vine and, and being a branch grafted into the vine with the, with the power of the, of the Holy Spirit, that nourishing, life-giving sap flowing through us. Maybe God has showed you, hey, that's not you. You've not been grafted into the vine. You've never come to trust Him as Savior. You've never given your life to Him and trusted Him for your eternal salvation. If He showed you that this morning, then He showed you that because He wanted you to make a decision about that. He showed you that so that you would see your lost condition. And through seeing your lost condition, you would, you would realize your need for Him and, and you would come to Him in, in repentance and faith and give your life to Him. See, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants everyone to be saved. And if He's shown you that, then the worst thing you could do is hold Him at arm's length and, and, and try to ignore that. Maybe you're here this morning. And you know you're saved. You know that you've been crafted into the vine. You know that, that, that the Holy Spirit lives in you. Now maybe you're one of those branches that's, that he needs to lift up a little bit. That he needs to work with, with a little bit. Maybe, maybe some correction is needed in, in, in your life to, to, to draw you back into close fellowship with him. To draw you back into a fruitful relationship with him. If God has showed you that, would you respond to him? Would you submit to him? If God has spoken to your heart this morning about anything, Again, he's sovereign. He's the master. He's the authority. And whatever he shows you, 
needs to be dealt with. And so this morning, if he's shown you anything, in just a moment, Candace is going to play a hymn of invitation. After I lead us in a word of prayer, the altar will be open. If you need to come and, and do business with the Lord, you do that. You be obedient to him. You submit to him. Let's all stand together, heads still bowed, eyes still closed. Again, I'm going to pray, and after I pray, Candace will begin to play. And you do as God leads you this morning. Father, thank you that you are the true vine. Thank you that you are our sovereign. You are our master. And Father, I pray, Lord, that if you're working in anyone's heart this morning about anything, be it salvation, be it, be it correction, whatever the case may be, Father, I pray that, Lord, they, they would mind you this morning and they, they, they'd be attentive to you and they'd be obedient to you. Father, have your will and your way this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As Candace plays, if you need to come this morning, you come. God speaks to your heart, you come. may be seated. I hope that as we've gone through these I am statements of Christ that, that you've come away with a closer, more personal, more intimate glimpse of who he is and what he wants to do in your life and in the lives of others. Because he truly is all the things that we've looked at and so much more. Amen. Very quickly, just a couple of announcements before we close. Uh, tonight, 6 o'clock, evening service here in the, in the sanctuary. We're going to continue into, in, in our study through the book of 1 John. We're going to hit a, a kind, of, kind of a difficult passage tonight. But it's one that's very important. And so I encourage you to be here. Uh, if you're not able to come, we're, we're, going to, we're going to try to get the live stream working for tonight. Uh, but if, but it, if you're going to watch over the live stream or watch it at a later date, the, the, the note sheets with the blanks, those are on the website. You can print those off and follow along as you, as you listen or as you watch the, watch the service tonight. But I encourage you, if at all possible, to be here at 6 o'clock tonight. And uh, Praise Team will open with a couple songs and then we'll, we'll dive right into 
the, the book of 1 John. We're in chapter 5, and we're getting close to the end of 1 John. We're going to go on and do 2 and 3 John afterwards. So I encourage you to, to be here for that and be a part of that. Don't forget to pray for the preschool. Uh, they're going to be having a summer day camp this year starting June 15th. It's going to run through July 30th. And, and so you pray for them as they prepare for that and get, get things ready for that. And pray the Lord works that out and, and things go, go very smoothly as, as a lead in to, to the new school year next year. Also, if you signed up earlier this year, if you recall, we, we, we were asking for volunteers to help plan Spring Fest and, and Vacation Bible School. Obviously, we're not going to have Spring Fest this year, okay, because that's, that's kind of coming on. But we do still want to do something in the way of a Vacation Bible School, uh, a, a shortened, like, like, like three-night version or whatever. So if you are, if you had volunteered to, to work on one of those planning teams, then, then please let us know if you'd still be interested in working on that, whether it's Spring Fest or VBS. We, we just need some folks to come together and get some plans made for, for, a, for a short, small vacation Bible school later on this summer. All right. So see myself, see Jill, you know, send us a message and let us know. And we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and get those things planned and, and on the calendar and, and start making some progress towards that. Amen. Well, once again, I thank you for being here with us this morning. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for, for uh, your attentiveness this morning. And I pray that we look forward to seeing you back again tonight. Let's all stand together. We'll be dismissed in a word of prayer. I'd like to ask, uh, Brother John, would you close for us, please? God bless you folks, you're dismissed.